puts that in my looking glass. Shall we pray? Father, please open up our hearts now as we move into your word. Teach us this night and help us, mighty Father, to be hearers and doers of your word because we want to be like Jesus. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Looking glass, a looking glass is an 18th century term for what we normally call a mirror. A mirror is a very handy thing. It does not say anything, and yet it can tell us quite a lot. There are certain things that we do that we would find very difficult if we didn't have a mirror. And as such, we may think that mirrors are modern inventions, but the truth is they are really quite old. Archaeologists have found mirrors dating back to the Greco-Roman era, long before the days of Christ. Ancient mirrors were made of highly polished copper or silver or bronze or tin. There are all kinds of mirrors. There are plain mirrors and concave mirrors and convex mirrors and uh, spherical aberration mirrors I found and parabolic mirrors and uh, convergent beam mirrors. There are all kinds of mirrors. Um, mirrors, mirrors upon mirrors. Modern mirrors trace their origin to a fellow by the name of Joshua von Liebig who made the first modern mirror in 1835. Uh, mirrors are very interesting things. They reflect light. They tell the truth. And so the truth is that we humans have been checking ourselves out in mirrors for a long time. We need mirrors. You have to have a mirror. For most men, we need a mirror to shave. Now, I've developed the ability to shave without a mirror. It's very easy. I start the razor here and just take it on around. <laughs> but for most men, they need a mirror to shave. We need a mirror to tie our tie correctly and make sure that that, that knot is just in the middle. You've got to have a nice little mirror to make sure that the knot is right where you want the knot to be. Getting our clothes straight requires a mirror. For many women, applying makeup and face powder requires a mirror. Now, men like to think that women hog the mirror more than men. But if the truth be told, there are a lot of men who spend a lot of time in the mirror also. In our home, uh, luckily, we have one and a half baths. Because if we didn't, We'd have trouble in the morning. Uh, Irma likes time in the mirror. I like time in the mirror. And we decide who's going to get what mirror, you know, as we get up. The first person in the big mirror gets the big mirror. The other person takes the little mirror. That's how it works for us. There is a famous picture, a little video vignette in New York City of a woman driving down the highway at some, oh, I guess, 70 or 80 miles an hour. She's got the visor down. She's steering the car with her elbows. In her one hand, she has a powder puff and powder. In the other hand, she has a mascara wand. And she's driving with her elbows while applying makeup, driving down the highway. She cannot see where she's going. Her eyes are fastened on the mirror as she's doing her face driving down the highway at 70 miles an hour. And the insurance company that made that commercial put up words that said, she's out there and you don't want to meet her. <laughs> and that is their advertisement for not driving without insurance. Though most people don't need it, we tend to brush our teeth in front of a mirror, don't we? You don't really need to, but it's just a habit. 
We use full-length mirrors to see how our outfits look. We comb and style and brush our hair in front of the mirror. I, of course, don't have that problem, but many of you do. And if you ever make the mistake of appearing in public with one black sock and one brown sock or one black shoe and one brown shoe or a piece of spinach in your teeth, the first thing they will say is, didn't you look in the mirror? Didn't you see what you looked like before you left the house? On the other hand, there are some people who are always in the mirror. Mm -hmm. They never pass a mirror without taking a little glance. A mirror doesn't say anything, ladies and gentlemen, and yet it has the ability to tell us when we look good and when we look bad. It doesn't invent anything. It simply reflects what's there. And a mirror's value is directly proportional to its accuracy in reflecting what it sees. In other words, if a mirror doesn't tell you the truth, it's not of value. A good mirror reflects the image as the image is. It doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't take away. It doesn't add. It simply reflects the image. That's what makes a mirror valuable. If you had a looking glass or a reflecting pool, you wouldn't know what you looked like until you looked in that mirror. Good mirrors don't lie. I say again, good mirrors do not lie. What you are is what you see. And if you don't like what you see, don't blame the mirror. Can you say amen? I say again, if you don't like what you see, it's not the mirror's fault. Mm -hmm. Because the mirror doesn't invent anything. It simply tells you if you're good or if you're bad. Our first text is Titus chapter 2. What book did I say? I'm in the second chapter of the book of Titus, Titus chapter 2, and we're going to be reading verses 11 and 12. Here we go, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. The Bible says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Can you say amen? So then, it is grace, ladies and gentlemen, that allows us to participate in the experience that we call salvation. Can you say amen? Grace makes salvation available, reachable, attainable, dare I say affordable. It is by the grace of God that we can acquire salvation for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl who has now, who is now living, whoever will live, and who has ever lived. If someone asks you, how do I get saved? Your answer ought to be short and sweet and simple. I am saved by Grace. One of the most important texts on the theology of salvation, justification, and sanctification, it was the foundation text for Luther's 95 theses, his 95 propositions that he nailed to the castle church at Wittenberg, is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And I think next to John 3:16. It is one of the most beautiful and sublime texts in the entire Bible. It is incredibly 
powerful and liberating. It is a foundation text for the Word of God. So let's go there. Ephesians chapter 2. What book did I say? Book of Ephesians. You're with me. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. It is foundational to the salvation experience. The Bible says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, that not of yourselves, it is a gift from God. So the grace that saves us is a God-given gift. Can you say amen? It's a gift. Grace is a gift. And the limousine that brings you the gift of grace is faith. It cannot be earned. It cannot be worked for. It cannot be ascertained through striving. Grace, ladies and gentlemen, is a gift. And faith is a gift. Can you say amen? amen? Ephesians chapter 3. What book did I say? Ephesians. You're with me. You can talk to me. It's quite all right. I'm not offended. Amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I have become a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Again, the grace of God is a gift. Grace is a gift. Say it with me. Grace is a gift. Now say this. Faith is a gift. Faith is a gift. So grace is a gift. Faith is a gift and they both come to us wrapped in a bow of love from God. Now, what does this have to do with my mirror? Well, here's my problem. Here's my problem. Jesus himself said, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. What book did I say? 1 John 3, 2. Let's turn to that. Now by this we know that we know him if we do what? Keep his commandments. That's how we know that we know him. If we keep the commandments, it speaks of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? If, if you're married to a person, there are certain things you do, there are certain things you don't do that are part of the marriage relationship. Commandment keeping is part of the relationship with Jesus. If you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 4. Verse 4 says, He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Truth is not in him. So, if, if you don't keep the commandments and you say you love Jesus, you're not telling the truth. Bible says you're lying because the symbol of a relationship with Jesus is keeping the commandments. Does that make sense? Does it? Yeah. Why would you say I'm in a love relationship with Jesus and then Jesus says, do this for me, and you say, nope, not going to do it. That's like you, you say, honey, I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you. And she says, okay, get me a glass of water. Nope. <laughs> if you love me, get me a glass of water. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well then, here's the problem. The problem is there are commandments to be kept. I cannot keep them. I've got a problem. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19. Galatians chapter 3, 19. What book did I say? Galatians. Okay, let's go. What purpose then does the law serve? The Bible says it was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Genesis, uh, rather Galatians 3.19, what purpose does it do? The law 
shows us when we're right and when we're wrong. The law of God then gives us a picture of ourselves. That says that the law of God then is a what? It's a mirror. The commandments of God are a mirror. When we look at the commandments, we see ourselves as we really are. Can you say amen? They don't add anything. They don't take away anything. They give us an accurate picture of what we look like. 1 John chapter 3. We're doing a little Bible hopping. 1 John chapter 3. What book did I say? 1 John chapter 3. All right, here we go. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. If you have an Old Testament, uh, or rather a King James uh, Bible, it says, whosoever commits sin also transgresses the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. And of course, uh, those of you who know Greek know that there are several words that are translated sin. You've got anomia, pedoptoma, malusmus, um, hamatia, hamatia means missing the mark. It's like you're shooting at something and you miss the mark. The Bible says that's sin. You've got pedoptoma, which means you're walking alongside the law, but not on the law. You're not walking in the footsteps of Christ. You're walking on a parallel path. That is sin. Then you've got anomia, which is called lawlessness, which is what the text is using here. It's saying, whosoever commits sin acts lawless, acts as though there is no law, for sin is lawlessness. You have to have law, ladies and gentlemen, to define sin. No sin, no law. The only reason speeding is illegal is because somebody said 55 miles an hour is the speed limit. If you go above 55 miles an hour, you're breaking the law. I can remember one time I was trying to hurry up to get to prayer meeting, Pastor. I'm going to prayer meeting. And I had my foot on the accelerator really fast. And the New York City police pulled me over. And I had my clergy sign in the window. And uh, he said, are you a minister? I said, yeah. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to church. And I'm a little late. He said, well, you're going about, well, I won't tell you how fast I was going. I was, I was going above the speed limit. He said, do you believe in God? I said, yeah, I do. He said, well, if you don't slow down, you're going to meet your boss. <laughs> and he said, have a nice day. And he let me go. Now, I could have just tore out of there, you know, to try to get to church fast. But I took my time, and I, I went right at 55, maybe 56, maybe 57. <laughs> but I didn't speed anymore because I needed to keep the law. We need the law, ladies and gentlemen, to show us what sin is. Can you say amen? No law, no sin. The law sets the parameters. The law shows us when we're right. The law shows us when we're wrong. The law shows us when we're good. The law shows us when we're bad. The law, then, is a mirror. It serves as a mirror to show us how we are. And if you don't like what you see in the mirror, is it the mirror's fault? No. You've got to change the image. The mirror just tells you the truth. And if you don't like it, then you've got to make the changes. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect. Amen? The law of the Lord is perfect. The problem is we are not. Law is perfect. Law is fine. Law looks pretty good. The problem is, I don't. Not the law's fault. The fault is in me. So I realize my imperfections when I go to the mirror. I see my warts and my scabs and my acne and my mismatched socks and the spinach caught in my tooth and, and my crooked tie. I see all of that when I look in the law. But if I didn't have the mirror, I would not see myself. So the law then is a mirror. Sometimes, you know, I hear things being preached. As I watch uh, television and other places, I hear things being preached. And I wonder, as I hear these different theologies, did that guy look in the mirror before he started that? Did he look in the same mirror and come up with that theology? 
He's looking in a different mirror than I'm looking in. I don't know what he's looking in. So when I look in the mirror, I see myself ugliness and all. I don't look at me because the same mirror that shows me my warts shows you yours. Amen? Amen. So rather than looking at mine, you look in your own mirror. Amen. So I see myself. I see how good I look. I see how bad I look. I see myself as I really am. How do I know that I'm not so good and that I look bad? Romans chapter 3, verse 23. What book did I say? Romans 3, 23. So you're awake. You're still with me. Romans 3, 23. I know it's hot in here tonight. It's very, very warm. They tell me this is Chicago. By tomorrow, there could be 20 feet of snow on the ground, so I don't know. Tonight is warm. But Romans 3, 23 has something to say. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How many have sinned? How many have sinned? Everybody. All have sinned. How many is all? All. Is there anybody in here that's not all? So I could say, in the parlance of Southern Illinois, all y'all have sinned. That's what they say down in Southern Illinois. All y'all have sinned. We don't say that in New York. We say yunts. Not really. That's Western New York. All includes you and includes me. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the same mirror that says, I have sinned and I don't look good, says you have sinned and you don't look good. The problem is that's enough to depress me. When I look in the mirror of God's law, I see how bad I look. I can come away depressed because everybody has sinned. And then uh, three chapters later in 623, it tells me the wages of sin is, that's pretty depressing. The wages of sin is death, and everybody has sinned. So everybody deserves to? Boy, that's depressing. But God doesn't leave us in that repressive state. Galatians chapter 3. What book did I say? Oh, praise God. Just do with me. Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 through 26. Um, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Let's pick it up. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we may be justified by what? So when you look at the law and you're depressed at what you see, it's okay because the function of this mirror is to help me realize that my success will be found in Jesus. Amen? Yeah. My success will be found in the Lord. It's the law's job to drive us to Jesus. The law is holy, just, and good. I am not. How do I get right? Go to Jesus. Can you say amen? That's the key. So when I look in the mirror, I don't like what I see, and I am forced to the realization that I have no way to change my image. The law, Romans 7, 2, 7 12 rather, is holy, just, and good. Romans 7, 14 says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. I'm born to sin. That's the problem. I got a holy law and a holy God, and yet I am carnal. So what do I do? Well, Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and, 7 and 8. What book did I say? Romans chapter 8. You're finding it for me, and finding it with me, rather. Romans 8, verse 7. Because the, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That, that, that's tough. In my flesh, I can't please God. I can't make God happy. I look in the mirror. I see my imperfections. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm in a fix. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. In the book of Romans, chapter 3 and verse 20. Therefore, by the, deeds of the, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's the purpose of the law. Not to depress you. Not to make you sad. 
simply to let you know where you stand. If I, if I have this, come out with this towel on my head, and nobody tells me, I won't know until I go and look. That's the function of the law, to let you know where you stand. And if you didn't have the law, you wouldn't know how and where you stood. But even plastic surgery can't correct my faults. Can't do it. Go to a good dentist, get your teeth fixed. Not enough. Tummy tuck. Not enough. Ears bob. Not enough. Hair replacement. <laughs> Not enough. Because the problems that I have aren't physical. They're heart problems. They're inside my soul, and it takes the power of the living God to do something about those problems. So what's going to happen? What do I do? Romans chapter 5, verse 8. We're in the book of, you know, let me commend you to read the book of Romans. If you want to read a powerful book that is chock full of powerful statements, read Paul's letter to the Romans, just statement after statement after statement after statement that affirm us in our Christian walk. It is a powerful book, and I dare say that a good Christian ought to read Romans at least once a year. It is a powerful book in the New Testament. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Here we go. But God demonstrates, King James says, commendeth his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ did what? Christ died for us. Isn't that a powerful statement? God didn't wait for you to get right. God didn't wait for you to get cleaned up and perfect. God didn't wait for you to get all nice and neat. God died for you in the face of Jesus Christ while you were still sinning. Commends his love, proves his love, demonstrates his love that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm in Romans 5, 20 now. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. The Bible says, but where sin did what? Abounded. Grace abounded how much? Much more. If you have a Bible and a little pen, put a line under that. Powerful text. Incredibly powerful text. That's a text you can plant your feet on. Where sin abounds, Grace does much more abound. Now that says to me, among other things, it doesn't matter what your sin is. You know, we like to talk about either, each other's sins. Well, she did that and he did that and I would never do that. Yet you're doing something else. Mm-hmm. That text let me, lets me know that it doesn't matter what your sin is. It doesn't matter what you've done. Where sin abounds, grace does abound much more. So whatever you've done, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. Grace abounds much more. I'm so glad for the grace of God. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Romans 6, 14. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. The Bible says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under what? Grace. Underline that text, please. The Bible is saying here, sin's not going to control you anymore. You hear me? Sin is not going to determine your life anymore. It's not going to have dominion. It's not going to control your past. It's not going to control your present. And praise God, it is not going to control your future. Sin is not going to be the determining factor as to where you will spend eternity. Eternity, rather. It is not going to have dominion over your life because you're not under the law. Under the law does not mean that the law is done away with. It simply means you're not left to the penalty of the law. You don't have to suffer anymore. You see, all the law can say is, Murray, you need to take that towel and wipe that sweat off your head. That's what it says. 
But it's not the mayor's fault that I've got to do the wiping. It's my fault. Amen. Because if I stood up here maybe and, and talked very quietly and never moved, maybe I wouldn't do that. But I can't do that. So I've got to move, Pastor. And I get excited. Praise God. So it's not the mayor's fault. Sin doesn't have dominion over me. That can control my future. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Love this text. Love it, love it, love it. The book is Romans. There is now, there is therefore now no condemnation. That's what the law does. Condemns. Because it tells you when you're wrong. But there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? They don't walk according to the flesh. They walk according to the Spirit. No condemnation. So I'm not under condemnation anymore. I'm not exceeding the speed limit. I don't have to worry about getting a ticket. I don't have to worry about the, the policeman pulling me over because I'm not under condemnation. I'm safe in Jesus. Praise God. James chapter 1, uh, 25 and 2, 12, call it the law of liberty. Not only does the law not hold you down, it frees you. The law is not an oppressive thing, not something trying to hold you down. It actually frees you. It frees us from the tyranny, from the condemnation. Now, Pastor Dinsley, I want you to go to the back and bring my little zippered blue and black case. I've got something I want to show the folk in just a minute. Let's go to James chapter 1, verse 22. What book did I say? James chapter 1 and verse 22. Coming to an end. We'll be done in just a few minutes. Here we go. James 1 and 22. Because the Bible says, but be what? Doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Not enough to just hear the word. You've got to make changes. Thank you, Pastor. That's just what I need. I'll use it in just a second. We've got to be able to make changes. We've got to hear the word and then put it into practice. Now let's pick it up at verses 23 and 24. This kind of ties it all together. Verses 23 and 24, same chapter. James says, If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a what? In a mirror. He's looking at himself in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately does what? Forgets. You see yourself in the mirror. You forget what you just saw. God has told you, hey man, woman, you need Jesus. I do. And then you turn around and you forget all about it. You go back to the things of the world. You go back to your lifestyle and you forget what you saw in the mirror. But every time you turn to that mirror, that mirror gives you the same image. It doesn't change. It cannot lie. It will always tell you the truth. The thing is, you've got to put into practice what the mirror has told you. When the law says you are outside of the law, you've got to change. When the policeman says you are speeding, you've got to stop speeding. Amen and amen. Now, if my tie is crooked and I look in this mirror and I don't like this tie and I don't like what I see, I could just break the mirror. How's my tie? I can't see it. How's my tie? Still crooked. Mirror's fault? No. What does the change have to come? In me. Because every time I go to a mirror, I'm going to see what? Crooked tie. And unless I change my crooked tie, I'll never be like I should be. I won't be like Jesus. So we cannot change. We should not blame the mirror. Takes Jesus to make these changes in my life. Amen? Now I'm going to need seven quick volunteers. I need seven young people. Seven young people. I need children. Seven young people. One, two, 
I need some young people, really fast. Young people, need some little ones. Young people, really fast. I want you to come. Come very quickly. Come quickly, come quickly. Seven, I need seven of you, really fast. Seven young people. Seven young people. I need seven of you. And... Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> I don't believe it. My seven young people. Seven young people. There we go. There we are. There we are. I almost got afraid. I thought I left this home for a second. All right. Now, I want you to line up right here. Just line up next to the straight line. Give me a line right here. Straight line. Give me a line. Real fast. Give me a line. Face that way. Face those people. Face off. You come here. And you come here, 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 and you come here. Okay. There. Okay. There. There. You go. There. God bless you. Okay. You go. All right. Okay. Now, I want you to hold these signs up for me when I give them to you. All right. Here we go. I'm going to start on the far end. Hold this up. Just hold it right in front of you. Can you see that? Hold it straight up so the folks can see. What is that? Okay, now whenever I point to that sign, I want you to say that. Let's practice. This is the? This is the? Need a little louder. This is the? Amen. The? Is a transcript of the character of God. Amen? So then the? Is unchangeable. It does not change because God does not change. The? Is the mirror. The mirror is the? Law. So we have the? Law. Transcript of the character of God. Now, this is? What is this? Yeah. This is? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Is the transgression of the? Law. This? Yeah. Is the transgression of the? Law. If you don't have? Law. You don't have? Yeah. So, yeah. is the transgression of the? Law. Praise the Lord. You got it? No, 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 amen. You're doing well. This is, this is, is pardon for, which is a transgression of the, we need, because all of us commit, which means all of us break the, we are saved by, through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. We are saved by amazing, Grace. which is pardoned for, Grace. which is this transgression of the... Law. Now you folks are starting to fatigue on me. It's not that hard. All right. Now we have... Jesus. Who is this? Jesus. Again? Jesus. Say it with a little more oomph. Jesus. There you go. Gives us, Grace. which is pardoned for, Grace. which is the transgression of the, Law. we all need, Jesus. because we all commit, Grace. so we need his, Grace. which is pardoned for, Grace. which is the transgression of the, <sighs> amen. All right, now we have, so this is, gospel. the gospel is the good news of, who brings us, Grace. which is pardoned for, Grace. which is the transgression of the, Law. the, Law. the Law. condemns Grace. and Jesus. condemns. Grace. So we all need, Grace. because Grace. is pardoned for, Grace. which is the transgression of the, Law. amen. Don't get tired of me. Stay with me. Got a couple more. All right. This is a? Amen. Now, we need a? To tell us about the? Which is the good news of? Who gives us? Which is pardoned for? Which is the transgression of the? Amen. The? Is the one who's up here perspiring telling you about the? Which is the good news of? Who gives us? 
which is pardoned for? Sin. Which is a transgression of the? Law. Amen. This is the? Church. Amen. The? Church. The? Church. We are sitting in a? Church. Listening to a? Free. Who's telling us about the? Church. Which is the good news about? Jesus. Who gives each of us? Free. Which is pardoned for? Free. Which is the transgression of the? Law. Make sense? Amen. It all ties together. If you don't have this, you can't have this. So those who say this is done away for, are, away with rather, are really, are really asking for license to do this. Amen? Amen? Yeah. If you don't have this, then you don't have that. And people who want to do this have got to do away with this. But they also have got to do away with... Yeah. We cannot keep, no matter how we try, can't keep, can't do it, cannot do it. The law condemns. We cannot do it because we all, and this is not, you can't will your way out of this. You can't say, today I will not, can't do it. Can't, even if you lay in your bed, your mind will, mm-hmm. And if you don't, indeed, you'll, in thought, amen? Yeah. Driving down a highway, singing a beautiful song, and somebody cuts you off. Amen? You know, I have a friend, president of a conference, bought a brand new Oldsmobile back in the 90s. Parked it in front of his house, went upstairs, came down the next morning, all the doors were gone. They just took the doors. Just the doors. He didn't say anything, but he sure thought about it. You can do this in thought and in deed. Amen? You can in your heart. And God reads the intents of the heart. So you can leave the church feeling on top of the world, feeling like you can conquer the world, and somebody will say something or do something, and immediately you will. That's why you need... Yeah. Because, because it's pardoned for, which is a transgression of the... It's part of the justifying experience. The moment you say, I give my life to, you get credit for righteousness. Amen? That's justification. The instant you say, I give my heart to you, he gives you, mm -hmm. and that includes pardon for, at that second. And then that same act of, allows the Spirit of God to work in you, and through you, and with you, so that you actually become sanctified, which means you actually do get better, and better, and better. Christ at the justification process pronounces you better and good. And then he sets about through to make you what he has already declared you to be. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? But it doesn't start until you look into the, the mirror, the law. And the law says, hey man, hey woman, hey boy, hey girl, You've got a problem. You need to go to Jesus. You need to go right here. And he will give you marvelous grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. John, come on up. I want you to sing. And I know we're running short, short of time, but we may have to go out on this. I'm going to ask him to go out on this song uh, because it's a little longer than we have time left. But I want him to sing this song because it, it bespeaks what we're talking about. John, sing the song for us, please. How many of you want to say by standing with me, Lord, I want to look in the mirror, and if there's anything in that mirror that is unlike you, give me the strength to take it away. 
How many want to be clean and in the image of Christ Jesus? 